So I am Sean Brakefield. I am the uh, the creator and like developer of Infinite Painter. Um, so and we have Andrew here, and he's going to introduce himself. But just killer, killer artist. Thank you, Sean. And for those who don't know, Infinite Painter um, mobile app for your Android and your iOS devices. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. I think we can actually work on the M1 chip Max now, so you can use. Uh, on the Max, and, also and is there any other device? Chromebooks as well. Yep. Yeah, and so today I'll be working on my um, iPad Pro, pretty standard setup. Um, I think when people jump in and they look at this app, it's going to look a little bit different than what I have. And if I could kind of just hide uh, some of the tools here, you're going to pop into this app uh, with a blank canvas. Actually, maybe I'll go home real quick. Um, the home settings where you can start uh, creating your canvas and uh, your recording settings for a video, if you want to make it, um, it's going to look pretty plain. And I feel like a lot of what uh, people struggle with when they're interacting with computer interfaces, is just all the gizmos, the gadgets. And what I love about Infinite Painter is it's completely blank um, and it almost lets you build and create your own app. Um, so when I'm starting um, and I'm opening the app for the first time, I want to put together my settings. You'll notice that your tools at the top of the toolbar up here are going to look a little bit different. And before we jump in, I just want to make sure that everybody realizes that all of the tools that we've got uh, in the drop down menus, which are up here at the top, um, any of these little icons um, for your settings for the layers, everything can be dragged and dropped and customized up to the top of your bar. Um, so if you're wondering why my interface might look a little bit different than yours, uh, that's why it's because you can drag and drop any of your favorite tools and get those uh, front and center for what you need. Um, so if I can introduce myself, I am a painter, illustrator, uh, studied in Florida for almost my whole life. A little bit of it was just, you know, doodling. And just before college, I became um, aware of, uh, you could go to art school. And what that meant for me was I wasn't going to go into the military or some other genre of, of workforce. And it really actually gave me the boost into the art scene and taking it professionally and seriously. That was many years ago. Uh, and now I do paintings for advertising, concept art, for film, TV, illustrations for books, stuff like that. Um, and so today I'm going to be showing off a few tools that um, any maybe concept artist or even someone who's doing a plein air painting or a study um, who may struggle with the, the logistics of perspective drawing. Um, Infinite Painter has tools built in that are going to help you as a guide. And uh, when I was going to school, they had pretty ridiculous amount of studies for your uh, perspective education. And it's so complicated that even some of the teachers didn't remember exactly how it worked. So um, I'm going to go through today and just kind of show you some really quick tools for getting an interesting um, perspective going. And uh, I'm using a painting I did a couple years ago um, with the same exact grid tools. So you'll, you'll be able to see exactly how I break that down. In our drop down menu here, you can customize your, your main toolbar. Um, but if you look at the top, you're going to be able to toggle between um, more of like photo editing style tools and then your painting and drawing and mark making style tools. Um, so in there, I'm actually gonna go through a bit of perspective and, and kind of show you what exactly that means. Everybody knows one point perspective and there's not much to confuse here. If, if you're having trouble seeing the guides, please let me know, but they're basically these little gray marks that are gonna show you how the perspective is being drawn. Um, here, I can toggle on and off the snapping so I can doodle however I want. Uh, or if you have the snapping on, you're basically going to be able to draw in perspective with a magnet tool. It's basically locking you in, into the view that you have. So every mark you make is either going to go towards the vanishing point or follow the plane. Uh, in this case, we're just in one point perspective. Um, so this is really useful if you're out sketching uh, maybe like a taco truck and you just want to get the basic uh, anatomy of, of perspective and how a vehicle might look. Um, it's really easy to just kind of get your initial marks on, maybe turn off the magnet uh, and sketch out some of the rest. Maybe you have some people and stuff and a funky sign at the top. So the reason these are really interesting and good is not because it's um, 
you're going to use them till the end of your painting or your drawing, but it's really good for getting the foundation and making sure everything's kind of going back, especially if there's architecture in the background that kind of follows that same vanishing point. Uh, so really interesting to have uh, just right off the bat without any heavy setup or having to draw um, these grid lines yourself. The magnet is going to be a key feature to help you. Um, but let's go into something a little more complicated now. Um, one thing that's, um, as we move forward, you're going to start to realize with one point perspective, we just had that one dot, but in the two point perspective, we have um, two points we can add anywhere. Um, you can do really interesting things. I haven't actually considered something like this, but I can I imagine you could have some sort of like dynamic Spider-Man pose uh, or uh, scene that you want to put together. So I'm just going to stick with a pretty standard uh, horizon line here and show you some of the powerful features that happen when you combine tools together. So we have the two point perspective as a tool, but what happens if we combine a rectangle tool? Um, so if I can go one more time, just to show you where that is right here. So um, I have a, a, a brush right now, it's just a line brush. And you can kind of see how when I draw out, it's gonna create the, sh the shape of a square and it's gonna follow, like you said, it's gonna follow the vanishing line wherever you uh, wherever you move that in space. One thing I really, uh, really like to do is combine a solid fill brush, which you can find in the fill area. Um, combine that with a square tool. And now we have planes, we have actual shapes uh, that are being kind of like presented into the perspective grid. And I can edit those and tweak them as much as I need at first initially. Um, and that's gonna go the same way for a circle if we wanna do that as well. And this is like extremely fantastic for if you're doing any sort of vehicle design um, or architectural design where you need some sort of, um, in Photoshop, I can't even figure out how to make a circle without drawing it over and over and over. Um, so I'm not gonna go into some of the other tools that'll help you maybe draw a circle, but just the fact that we can drop this into space and reorganize it wherever it needs to go with the snapping on. Uh, one thing that's gonna be really useful if you're creating like a wheel hub or something for concept art, um, let's make this a little bigger, is right here, there's right above where I'm, I'm pressing is a little stamp icon, which when you hit that, you're gonna get a secondary circle. And that'll be really useful if you're trying to get this to go into space, you duplicate it, and now we'll add, uh, let's turn that off. Now you can add like little details to the rim. Uh, and, and you have what appears to be maybe just a tube going off into space if it's a tunnel or something. Nice. So really good to have some of these tools snapping into perspective. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that as I break down um, how to get this fancy illustration piece. Um, so of course for this, I have a, an extremely ginormous animal that I wanted to kind of feature, but one of the things that people struggle with when they're working on the sense of scale, um, you have this giant dragon, but really if he was in a pile of rubble or stone or volcano, you probably wouldn't know how big he is. So it's, it always helps to not just have a little bit of architecture or a wagon or horses, people, um, but also making sure that it feels like the scene is in a realistic sense of space and perspective. So in this case, we're gonna do a three point perspective, which is kind of what you do when you look up at uh, skyscrapers, um, definitely Spider-Man mode. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn on that. I've already matched it to be my perspective uh, for the drawing that I wanna to make today. And you can see where those three points are. Um, you can do this almost like as far off the canvas as you want to really get dramatic points. But for me, this kind of hit the spot. Uh, it feels like it's going up in space and we're kind of looking up at the dragon. Um, so I want to go through a few techniques to use the grid with the magnet on and off um, to kind of get towards uh, a sketch of a city that we want to do. So this is the original sketch. Um, and if I could mention, uh, we do a Inktober month in October and there's no undoes. We want it to feel just like it's uh, pen and ink. So this, this whole drawing here was done without undoes at the time. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of a heads up, a handicap so that you feel like you can also approach this too without having to undo it or, or fumble. Um, 
So I'm just going to turn off this main piece and um, show you how this might work if you're going to sketch it out. So I've got just a, a generic brush. Maybe I'll use a pencil. Uh, I was just watching the Proco demo, so maybe I'll work in a Proco pencil and uh, just kind of show you how that feels if you were to start doodling your own bits of architecture. Um, one thing that I think you want to avoid is, is sticking directly to the snap. Uh, the magnet here is either your friend or your enemy. So there are times where you want to use it because you uh, really do want to hit uh, a line where three buildings are going to line up. So you want to hit it there. Um, and then there's other times where you just want to turn it off real quick because you have some sort of decorative design at the top of the building. You just want to sketch that in right quick. Uh, or you have crumbling rubble and you can sketch that in then turn your, uh, your, your magnet back on and start doing some more detailed work like that. Um, so magnet's gonna be key, but for me, what I like to do if I'm, if I'm sketching in perspective is not to just stick to the magnet, um, but to also uh, turn it off. And let's see if I could turn this down a little bit more. Um, so originally, uh, if you're doing this in Photoshop, I believe there's some techniques where you have the grid set up and you just kind of manually draw. I would suggest doing that at first. So if you have some sort of uh, architecture and cliffside in the background, just wing it at first. And you know, put in your blocks. Uh, they just represent placeholder for where you think a bit of the city, the towers, um, maybe the lookouts, everything that they're gonna have in this town. Um, Go ahead and sketch it out because you want the flow to feel like you have organic line art uh, and a, a true artistic feel to it without it being too much like a 3D program. Uh, and that's why I suggest turning on and off the magnet. Um, so I think if you're sketching out at first and you're trying to fill the void with a really interesting vibe and flow, you can do that really quickly with just the basic shapes and kind of follow the generic lines that you see in the perspective grid. So um, that's one way to just kind of get your flow for uh, some of the architecture. Um, I'm going to turn this layer off. Let's clear that. And let's maybe talk about how you might draw something organic in space. So obviously, he's not a rigid body dragon. He's going to have voluptu uh, voluptuous curves and forms that are going to change and morph in space. Um, but there's a few things that we can maybe do to kind of hint at it without using the magnet um, to get some of these shapes to really feel like they're going out in space. And maybe the first thing you do is break it down into building blocks. Maybe at first it is built of something a little more angular. And you can kind of try to fill the space while roughly following the guides. Obviously, it's going to shift a little bit as it goes up into space. But this is so much easier than trying to picture this <laughs> from my head and, and get this to work into space. So having this as kind of a crutch at first, is going to really help out. Um, and so you can kind of see how I'm going up into that three point, but I'm also like getting smaller and curving into the distance. That's one way to do it. Uh, another one that I was just playing around with, let's clear that, is if we turn the magnet back on and we want to use something cylindrical. So we're going to keep this pencil. Um, and get it to go. Which way do I go to slide? Here we go. So I can use a circle, use the circle uh, as gonna, kind of the. Mm -hmm. I was going to pause for a second. That's okay, Andrew. Um, so yeah, so one thing he was just showing right there is, um, so basically the circle can snap to any of the directional like planes um in perspective so for example he was trying to basically create a cylinder that's going up the neck and so um he would pull up towards that vanishing point to make it kind of flat um, but if you wanted to snap to one of the other vanishing points then you would pull towards that other vanishing point mm -hmm. um, so it's so an it, if you um if for example uh you kind of like you you drag it in the wrong direction. You just don't let go. Just bring it back into the center, and then you just drag to the other direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so yep, like you said, change it up. Uh, as soon as I hit the center point, you're going to get that switch, and so it'll kind of help you get to two different directions. If you did it wrong, just go left and right. Um, so you can see how it's swapping, and that's because my fingers or my paintbrush is still on the canvas as I flip it around. Um, so as you said, 
the best way to do a circle like this would be to drag down or up. And one way that I kind of cheat it is to just use that clone button, move it up a little bit, scale it down a little bit, clone it again, move it up, scale it down. And so we're kind of getting a little bit of the ridge here. Um, one thing you could also do if you turn off the uh, snapping for the next one, oops. There we go, let's get that. So we put those into place and let's turn off the snapping and, and bring out the eraser. So right now these tubes don't necessarily, necessarily line up or feel like they're in the right place. I think it's because um, you're starting to see the front and back. Um, so you can quickly go in with a nice eraser, solid fill eraser. Oops, I've still got the circle on. And just kind of tear out those background portions. Here we go. So now what's happening is we're starting to see the form as it turns around the body. And you can kind of fill it in like this. So this is just an elementary way to try and get basic forms, tubes to go into space using really simple tools, uh, mixing your point perspective um, with the circle tool. Yeah? So really easy and interesting way to kind of get the rough draft rolling out. And I'll just skip forward and show you what that kind of looks like if I uh, were to go all the way. So here, uh, one thing I want to point out about kind of like your creative choice, your artistic decision making is um, in reality, we would be seeing so much more of the underbelly of his jaw in this case. And I know that because I could put a block there and you would get the full underbelly. And it, it's really easy to see it with this kind of thing. But for storytelling, for uh, intensity, emotion, maybe you decide that's really not gonna work. We don't wanna see just the underbelly. Um, so that's why I kind of create my own uh, artistic decision to do a little bit of a side view. Um, even though most of the body kind of goes up and then the head kind of transforms, it's more of just to get the viewer to feel a little bit more emotion about what the dragon is, you know? Um, so just a key thing right there. Uh, let me turn this back off so you can kind of see the center line going down the belly here. It's just a really easy way to start to do your symmetry. So if you had any sort of pectoral muscles, um, abs down the middle, uh, scales or blocks of, of hard tissue that might be going around his body, it's a really easy way to sketch it out at first. And a lot of artists, um, even though you see the amazing dragon paintings that they're doing, um, they may be starting something simple like this, just a little bit of a wireframe to get that anatomy to feel right. Um, so don't be shy to go ahead and, and do something like that. Yeah. Also, uh, I mean, I love the way Andrew, if you mind for a second, I mean, I love mm -hmm. the way that like you kind of just kind of bent the rule like a bit, like as you know, as you are doing the head to make it more like intimidating and tends to kind of tell the story a bit more, um, yeah. you know, and, and I think that's an important thing to remember is that, you know, art is all about like choosing when to kind of bend those rules. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you get, you get past that as like a subconscious thought, uh, or maybe I didn't even know what a head looked like in perspective back then when I drew it. So going through this and having the literal translation of, of a tube going into space with the block as a head, very simple shapes is going to help you decide, okay, do I want to see the underbelly of his jaw? Is he in anguish? Is he, you know, tilting back and screaming? That could be your artistic decision. Um, so yeah. Thanks, Sean. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn on just the rough dragon without any of the architecture and um, just kind of show you the development of how you might get to something a little more realistic like this. And as you can see, there, there are many straight lines and you can see when the magnet is being used here, very, very straight line going across. Um, and then I turn it off and I go to town with some intricate details. Um, there are even some patterns in here, and I'll show you how to do that a little bit later. Um, but it's a mix of getting the basic form to be blocky. You want to you want to get your architecture to fit, um, and then turn the magnet off and go to town or your details or the things that make it feel like it's at a human scale. Um, and a lot of that just means flags, doors, windows, all the things that you might see in a courtyard or a shop. Um, so yeah, let's let's go ahead and let's find that layer with the dragon. 
And I just want to go through a few of those techniques. Like I said, you just want to doodle it out at first without hitting that magnet. Um, next way, and I'll turn this up a little bit more so you can see, is following your doodle. So this is kind of based on um, the earlier kind of flowy sketch I made. Um, and go ahead and hit the lines. Just be really brutal with the magnet here. Um, and I'll maybe add some more. I'll just erase some area here. And I mean, that's the thing is everybody has been using, you know, the iconic Photoshop to do concept art. Uh, eventually we moved into 3D programs to do more architectural stuff. Um, but now that tablets are in our backpacks and we can go to the coffee shop, like how do we do it? And I really, I'm just like so grateful for the um, technology that Sean's putting together um, because it's, it's almost like our childhood of really wanting to be mobile without carrying around oil paint or something. Um, so the fact that this technology exists and it's, it's opening up to PC and Android and everybody's getting on board, I think it's really promising. Um, not just for me, but for um, new artists who maybe have never even uh, dealt with a, three, a 2D program. Um, so if you're the generation of people who doesn't know Photoshop because you're too young, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, it makes me feel old, but, uh, and just a throwback, I, I think my first chance using Photoshop was in uh, eighth grade and I, I was just mind blown. Um, and it took a long time before digital apps started coming out mobily. So it's, it's been a wild ride, I'll say. Um, so you can see how I, I'm just doing like very simple stuff. The magnet is on. Um, if you go to town and just like do a bunch of tapping, you can kind of emulate, well, you know, just a scuffle of things that maybe, maybe there's some sort of architecture there. And I'm just like wiggling at it because I don't have an idea yet. Like, what do I want to put there? So if you just tap at it, it'll, it'll hit the perspective line. It'll go back into the correct space. Um, and it'll also give you a little bit of a funky idea of maybe where you want to go next. Maybe there's like a bridge going across. You know, so it's really interesting to play with. Um, but like I said before, it's a bit stiff. So you do want to take the time to block out the anatomy of your blocks and then turn off the magnet. And let's just zoom in a little bit, turn off the magnet and maybe a small brush here, put some gargoyles in. And this is all easily accomplished um, in, with the click of a button right there. Um, if yeah. you don't want to see your grid, but you do want the magnet, it's as easy as turn, turning that right most thing off. And let's just sketch. You'll see it's going to snap, um, but it doesn't necessarily distract from, from your space and your like general viewpoint. Um, one thing I want to go into now is like, what if you don't necessarily have the line drawing skills? You're more of like a blocky painter uh, and you want to just quickly block in some stuff. I'm gonna combine a few tools and I'm gonna tell you which ones they are. We still have three point perspective going on. Uh, I went in to get the rectangle shape. Um, and if I could just show you what that looks like as you draw in space, oops, wrong layer. As you draw in space, uh, you're gonna keep it locked at a rectangle, but the way to get it to fill is by using one of the solid fill tools. And I'll use one with a little bit of grunge here so you can see what that looks like. Um, but one I just made today, very simple. Um, let's go back to that. Uh, this one actually has a little bit of like a color jitter and transparency. So every time I draw a new, new box, it's going to give me a little bit of a random uh, color and value, which is good for when you have, when you're dealing with fantasy art, you don't know what you're going to pull off necessarily. So having a little bit of this random uh, value going into, into your drawing is going to be really well. So, like I said, this, this next piece is gonna look something like this. It's more for people who have like a blocky mentality or, or don't necessarily do line art. Um, and so, yeah, using this uh, fill brush, I'm gonna show you how to create something like that. Um, and again, if you're new to the uh, talk, we, we did mention about pulling towards the vanishing point in order to get the exact direction you wanna go. So if I want to hit a rooftop, which there's no rooftops in here, we would be ceiling, uh, sorry, seeing a ceiling, I would pull down. Um, in this case, there is some ground space, so I can pull up and we'll get a platform, which is the ground space. 
But for most of this, we're, gonna, we're either going to pull towards that vanishing point for the shadow side. And I'll just do that real quick. Shadow side of a building or towards the other point. There you go. Um, so you can see how my random color jitter really helps by giving me two different, it's not necessarily a light and a dark side. It's more of just being able to see the difference between the planes as I draw them. Um, and you can see here, there's no real light source going on, um, but it does help you get a different chunks, blocks uh, of your architecture for when you eventually go in with a little bit more line art. Um, so really fast, quick technique. And if there is something that you uh, mess up or you want to tweak, let's just go over here. Let's say that's not the exact shape. You'll notice that these little dots come up. They're like anchor points. Um, that's going to allow me, because it's still live, I have not tapped out of it yet. Um, that's going to allow me to continue to edit it. So if it's not perfect, I want it to go here. That's good. And as soon as you tap away, you're going to set it into the canvas. So that's going to be just kind of burnt into the canvas. Yeah, we kind of okay. take this approach of being uh, somewhat in a kind of vector state where you can edit it, but then um, then you know it prints it onto the canvas so that you can do uh, some of the more um, advanced techniques around um, painting, like blending and things like that. So, yep. That's crazy, honestly. I'm still amazed by it. And it, what's really good is just the fact that these tools are new to me and probably to you. So when you get a hold of them, I think it's difficult to um, to be fresh at tools like this because you haven't dealt with this kind of interface uh, or these types of tools before. So um, take it slow and, and just what I did when I first got involved with Infinite Painter is just kind of play with every tool, go down the list and see how it's gonna change your, your workflow. Um, yeah, because we, we try to bring that mentality of, um, you know, uh, trying to make, you know, this the best experience on touchscreen devices. And it's a whole different environment on touchscreen versus desktop. And so, like, because a lot of times the, uh, the shortcut keys are going to be, like, what you can do with gestures and things, right? Or um, trying to minimize what kind of controls you're working with. And so, you know, we try to think about each tool very differently. And... Um, yeah, so like he said, you know, a big part of it is just exploring and seeing, you know, what you can do with each one. And obviously we're always open to feedback too. So just throw it our way. Uh, we really try to listen, so. Definitely. And um, like I said, it's, 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 we're at a transition point where the world is backing a bit away from Photoshop as the leader of painting and, and design and illustration for digital artists, uh, which is awesome. And of course, there's going to be five, 10 apps you can download on your, your tablet. I think what's really awesome, though, is, is the fact that they're mostly affordable. So we can afford to buy each one of these apps, test them all. Um, and I think a lot of people who maybe have come in contact with some of the competitors, um, it doesn't fit with them. And that's OK, because maybe there's a few things that they do really well that you want to jump into that app for. Um, but you want to draw your perspective or, or do your, um, you know, this kind of work in Infinite Painter. So it really helps to jump into um, all the different programs and just kind of test out and see what's there without getting too frustrated. Because like I said, interfaces can be quite a bit annoying to, to first get hold of. Yeah, I totally second that. You know, you know, each, I mean, there's so many drawing apps out there and honestly, they're all, in relationship to like physical brushes that you would buy are so affordable that like, you know, some of them are going to do things very differently or, or better than others. And so, you know, use, I, you know, we encourage you to just use, use what works with your style and, you know, what works for the, uh, the problem that you're trying to solve in, in your design. So we do have a question here on um, that. Yeah. Uh, I think you would be great showing off, Andrew is um, one person um, asked whether they could basically map like brick textures onto the side of a building and how you might approach that design problem. Do you want to kind of walk through that? Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, I wish I had a brick photo right here to do it. Um, I, I'll show you, I'll kind of explain the way I would probably go about it. Um, and that's with the fill brushes. So the way that I'm using the, these 
blocks to kind of fill in a space, you can texturize that block. Maybe I can do it quickly. Actually, you know what? There is actually a bricks texture brush in the texture section. If you want to lay it out mm -hmm. and then um, maybe use like uh, transform distort or something. Oh, this one. Okay. Oh my, look at that. <laughs> It's not going to map. That's not going to map to perspective, but we're okay. going to, I think you, I think you have a great so I could, Okay. Well, this is a quick way to give me the texture. So let me, let me go ahead and do that. Um, let me just make a quick block here and I'll, I'll use it as a source real quick. Um, so a few things we can do. Let's get the selection tool and let's see, there's a few ways. In, in our distort, when you go into the, uh, sorry, the transform, you're gonna have your basic and your distort. Uh, and distort is probably gonna be the easiest to map. Let's get this into place. Put that here, this here, here, and here. So once it's into perspective, um, it's not beautiful. Like every time you work on uh, concept art and you're throwing in textures, it's not beautiful at first. So <laughs> let's keep that in mind. Um, but what it's really useful for is getting the base down, same way you would in 3D if you're doing a rough texture, uh, you get the base down and then you could start to on top of that paint. Um, so just like before, the way I was able to clone a shape, there is still this icon right here, right above that. I'm gonna click it. And if I go back into my basic transform, you're going to see that, that that literally follows into space. So I can quickly um, texture the side of this other building right here. So it's not necessarily the end product, but you can see how it added interest to it. Another thing that you could maybe try um, is creating your own textures that are built into one of the fill brushes, which is how I was making the blocks a minute ago. Um, so this grunge, let's go to the texture and see what it's using. That, um, this isn't brick, but it's close. So we'll see what that looks like. There we go. Um, so that, that would work again if I just go back to your fills. And just to answer the question, long format, you can texturize these fills to be brick. Right now it's just a grunge texture, um, but you could technically be doing what I'm, I'm doing here in a low opacity uh, using that and just, just this brick texture is enough to kind of give you a little bit of um, nuance in, in the shape. So you don't even have to draw in a lot of cases. You can jump straight into painting with blocks and shapes and just look at how this texture totally changed the side of, of this tower. Um, and if we had it in brick or stone, you can bring in photography. Um, but I think one thing I should probably show because it's so cool. Um, when you're dealing with the texture, let's get something colorful. And, and this is totally gonna go out of, uh, let's see what happens here. So if you bring in photos of bricks, you can actually use the color of the brick. Look at that. This is like a rainbow thing right now. Um, let's see what happens when I go like this. You have, you have opacity up like really high. Oh, like that's why, that's what it is. Um, so yeah, now I have colorized texture. This is probably the most powerful way to create what I'm doing here. Um, get your own brick texture, upload your um, texture into this space here. And uh, one thing that might help is to scale that down. Here yeah, we go. I'm going to add while you're kind of doing that too, is there's, there's also one other way you can add in patterns and textures, uh, which also might be a bit easier too, is we actually have a pattern fill tool um, where basically you can fill in, if you want to fill in a layer, for example, um, then you can control the rotation or scale of that, um, that pattern. Um, and then you can then map it onto uh, the building. Um, yeah, one person brought up the point of being able to actually map it directly on the plane. And that's definitely worth exploring in the future. Yeah, um, and as you saw there, I was, I was editing my brush in real time <laughs> just to get the size of the texture right. So that's what I think is like really fantastic. If you're gonna start bringing in your own photo sources or if you go to any of the free texture sites that are out there for 3D programs, you'll get access to that. Um, so another 
little interesting point that um, would be useful for something like this, especially if you're doing decorative art uh, on the sides of these buildings uh, or you're dealing with windows or something. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off some layers real quick, just so I can demo what you would do in the case of wanting to create a repeating pattern, whether it's just the blocks that are poking out of the, the top of the building or windows or decorative uh, facade. Uh, let me jump into just a generic brush. Okay. Since I'm gonna work in something symmetrical, let's pull out that tool real quick. And I'm gonna create a windowsill, something really kind of decorative. And I don't know if you guys knew this, but you can um, draw straight down or draw in any direction and hold the line. It will snap, uh, which is gonna be useful for me right here. Let me go ahead and lock that. And I'm gonna create some sort of decorative window here. And you can see how stepping aside, putting away your drag and putting away your city and working on something really small and detailed like this is actually gonna bring a lot of life into your piece, even though it feels counterintuitive, even though we're back at square one without any color or drawing on the canvas. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just beat this up a little bit for some window bars. And we'll say that that's the window design. Maybe a little bit more detail up here. I feel regal. Okay. So go ahead and turn the symmetry off. I want to create this as a, a repeating shape because I want to have a bunch of windows on the side of a building. Um, a few, and I'll, I'll let Sean kind of point out which one maybe he wants to show me first. Um, you think I should go with quilt or tile? Um, yeah, I mean, like I windows? in this place, like, you know, if you're, I think tile is fine to show off first and then like, you mm -hmm. know, show kind of what quilt can do afterward. First of all, I love getting a start right here because it gives you really interesting ideas. You can change your windows as is. Um, okay. Yeah, and you might not even want to flip them. You might just want them like totally vertical. Oops. Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize. So yeah, there's these two um, things here. You can click those on and off and you'll get totally different. And maybe that's what you want, maybe not. Um, so get the spacing right. Let's say we want the windows to be that far apart. Um, the way I would do this is, hmm, I would probably just make a selection. And interesting fact, uh, you can combine the selection tool and the square tool, and that's how you get a square selection. So I'm just gonna copy these with the word duplicate. And now those are floating in space. Let's go back to our architectural drawing here. Dragon back, some sketching under that. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and lock the layer. Half a lock it, yeah. Turn this black. And just kind of darken these. So now we'll be able to see it a little bit better. Okay. As I tried a second ago, uh, you get your basic um, design, your pattern, your doodle, sketch, whatever you want to fill a space with uh, in terms of a pattern. Uh, and just put your anchor points right into place. Let's see, look at that. So what's really cool is I could have went to town and painted this to be photorealistic with a little bit of glare, maybe um, you know just totally treated it like it was photoreal and it would distort into place perfectly with all the color you needed. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stamp that and oops, maybe I should bring it to basic and watch. This goes right back into space perfectly. It's oh, matching the perspective. It, scale. So like if you wanted to scale it as well. Hmm. Do I need the perspective grid on though to get it to? Yeah, I mean, I think this brings up the point that one of one of the uh, people on here brought up is that snapping to the plane like would also obviously help in getting the most accurate um, perspective here when you're distorting the image. Totally. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, I, th- I think the idea here is just really, um, you know, building out the scene and kind of get an idea of where the elements are. Yeah. Um, so these are all interesting ways to get to the point where you can start doodling on top. Um, and I used, if I can go back to the original artwork, let's turn off these other layers. Um, I used every one of those tools I just showed you. Um, the pattern, if we can see, it's so dark in there. Um, the pattern of the windows, and maybe I'll go to the line art instead. There we go. Um, this pattern that you see here with this repeating, um, repeating little decals, that I think I just used with the quilt and the pattern tools. Um, and so filling it with those four or five different techniques to get the line to look right, to get some interesting pattern, turning off your magnet to uh, sketch in some of the details. And then eventually you go in and texture it with your own bricks, um, crumbling walls. You can get moss texture, everything that you need to bring it to life, all in the 3D space that's kind of simulating it for you without you doing the hard part. Um, and it brings you to a point where you can get a lot of stuff done without having to think too hard. And I do feel bad for the teachers uh, who are still putting the kids through learning this from scratch, but I'm not sure you need to do it your own points perspective anymore. Um, for me, I, in Photoshop, I use so many tricks to get perspective to work. Um, and I've seen, I've seen a lot of techniques. It just, it's tedious. And like I said, even if you don't necessarily want to finish your product in this app, you just want to come here because we have a uh, perspective grid. That's really amazing. Um, we encourage you to do that because in the end, uh, it costs almost the same as like a really nice Starbucks, Starbucks drink. So if you can skip your caffeine for a day, you have free unlimited access to the perspective tools in the app. Um, and for me, there's so many projects in my professional and uh, education career where I could have used this um, and just really helps. Um, so if you guys are around again this weekend, I'm going to be flipping modes here, um, kind of taking a step back from concept art and bringing us more into the world of what an oil painter does. Um, we're going to be doing on Sunday a uh, figure painting using more painterly brushes. I know this is a very stiff kind of workflow for a lot of people. Um, so we're going to jump into what it feels like to have some really nice painterly fluid feel to the canvas. So it's almost like we're working uh, with traditional mediums. Um, and we're just going to throw out perspective and deal with the organics and the beauty of light, uh, texture, and how to get some really nice work, whether you're trying to create a sketch for a final painting a little bit bigger, or if you're just there practicing uh, with a model, we're going to show that stuff off next week. But you can see how if you're in the figure drawing room and you want to get a really accurate base for the board they're standing on or the stage, you can build the room in 3D using these perspective grids and then plop in your, your character who is the model that's posing. Um, what I like yeah, to do uh, is during the break period when the model's away, I'll work on the architecture or whatever's in the background. So you can combine this with what we're going to show next week. I hope to see you guys there. It's Sunday at, I believe, one o'clock. Um, uh, if you're there, we'll uh, be able to answer more questions. And if you think of anything else, don't hesitate to ask. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, since we have, you know, a couple more minutes, um, we could show off like one or two more things if you're interested, Andrew. Sure. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Um, you know, one thing we could show off is we could use the pin tool to kind of trace around the dragon or even the lazy guide um, to show off how you might do some clean line work. Sure. In terms of line art, I mean, the most beautiful strokes you can get are going to come when you have the... Um, Lazy guide, is that what this is called? Yeah, the lazy. Yeah, and people who are familiar with ZBrush are gonna kind of find themselves, or lazy, um, uh, what's the, Nizuma, I believe it is. Um, yeah, so this is gonna have, uh, you know, a lot of that similarity where the idea is to be able to uh, create, um, you know, very smooth line work. Mm. Um, yep. Yeah, and that's one of those things that I, I turn on um, towards the end after I'm done with all my sketching. One thing that's really impressive for any of those um, comic book style artists is the hatch tool. Look at this. If you can see my arm on, on screen while I'm also drawing. Oh, yeah, this one's hard to explain, but it's so cool. 
Um, I'm, so I'm not yeah. lifting from the screen. It's almost like as I'm, I'm creating hatch marks by just zigzagging. It's doing all the work by deleting the way back. The trip back is invisible. Which yeah, I, I wish think I, is really I wish you could fun. actually see like your uh, pointer on the screen, but um, but mm -hmm. yeah. So the hatching the hatching tool is actually um, pretty unique to the program. But yeah, the idea is that you would just zigzag back and forth, and it generates those uh, that that contour hatching or just hatching in general. Um, yeah. So um, we're going to go through a lot of other tools uh, later this weekend. But if you have questions. Uh, feel free to email if you can shout out your email or a uh, way that they can maybe ask. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and type um, it in the chat, um, but it's going to be Sean at infinite studio dot art. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions at all, uh, yeah, please shoot me an email. Um, I'd be glad to um, answer those. And um, yeah, I mean, we try to be like super, uh, we just try to listen. And, and see what you guys need. And um, yeah, we like to stay connected, so. Cool, uh, and what's your website, Sean? Yeah, so uh, it's actually www.infinitestudio.art. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there's also a community there that, um, that people can uh, chime into and offer feedback, ideas and suggestions. Um, or if you're having some issues with help and support, um, you can always uh, reach out there or even through our Instagram, which is infinite.painter. Awesome. Um, you can find my work at theonidas.com. Um, I'm also available if you guys want to ask some questions, I'll be happy to answer. Um, and we hope to put together a lot more tutorials in the future so you can kind of view that on your own time. Um, but yeah, so with that, I'll let you guys go. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, and enjoy the rest of the weekend. And, uh, you know, if you guys are available Sunday, uh, we'd love to have you there and we'll be exploring some organic and, you know, natural workflows in Infinite Painter. So, all yeah. right, take care. Cool. Thank you so much, Sean. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Bye. Yeah.